Thank you all. It's good to have my Lieutenant Governor here. He's doing an outstanding job. He's come up with some innovative ways to also help teachers. Good to see him in the crowd and uh, appreciate everyone's attendance. Um, you know, my dad uh, used to tell me there's, I said this at my inauguration speech, he'd, I'd be watching TV, Gunsmoke, or Leave it to Beaver or something, he'd say, shut off, shut off the TV and go exercise your brain. Read a book and exercise your brain. He says there are two reasons to get a good education. One is to exercise your brain and learn good logical thinking and learn from the past so you don't repeat history's mistakes and you repeat the good things that happened. And the second reason is try to get a skill which will make you more marketable so you get the heck out of the house. And uh, it was actually very good wisdom that he gave me. And uh, so it does tie into jobs, education, and it ties into our economic future. Harold Martin, you knew my dad very well because he helped out, at, you knew him well at uh, a and It's great to see you too. But I've got some good announcement to make today. Today, our unemployment rate dropped from 5.9% to 5.5%. And that's the uh, second largest drop in the United States this past month. And I think we've dropped faster than any state except for Florida in the last two years. We've gone from approximately adjusted 8.9% down to 5.5%. But we have a lot of work to do. And one of the ways we're going to keep getting out of this recession is through education. And to fill that skills gap that continues to exist not only in the United States of America, but also right here in North Carolina. And to have this cooperation that I see in this room between the universities, K through 12, the community colleges, and many businesses is the way we're going to beat our competition. And I want to beat our competition. In fact, I'm pleased to report that our unemployment rate is lower than South Carolina's right next door. <laughs> and lower than Tennessee's. And that's, that's something we couldn't say uh, two years ago. I want to thank uh, John Fenebrisk uh, for his leadership. I also want to thank Tom Ross for your leadership and, and good night. It takes often someone from the private sector to step up and make a difference. And uh, you're doing just that and we appreciate your leadership and thanks for allowing us in this beautiful auditorium also. Um, Ann's committee has identified seven recommendations that will strengthen and redesign, if needed, UNC's educator preparation programs to produce teachers and principals to drive student achievement to the next level. And that's exactly what we have to do. We always have to go to the next level. We cannot be satisfied with the status quo. And the data is crystal clear. States with the largest increase in educational outcomes are those with the largest increases in the income of their people and their businesses. And an overwhelming body of evidence and common sense tells us that the most critical factor in student success is the teacher in the classroom and the principal who leads the school. My sister was a teacher for 22 years. My sister-in-law is still a teacher. And every time they've come home and talked to me, they say, it's all about the principal leading the teachers, and then it's the teachers helping connect the students to the best way to gain that knowledge and exercise their brain. That is indisputable. And we've got to do everything we can to make that continue to happen right here in North Carolina. Now, I, I've got a, I'm thinking of something right now. We've made some great investments. I see some great state legislators here in the audience, and I'm very pleased to be working with them. Last year, we invested over $300 million into the strategic teacher raises. And uh, I'm working very hard. I spent two hours in a budget meeting today. We've got to fulfill that promise this upcoming session to ensure that no teacher in North Carolina is paid less than $35,000 a year, regardless of where they live in North Carolina. And that will continue to be our goal. And uh, we're working on that right near now. But you know, as I stand here today, I'm thinking of an event that occurred to me many, many years ago. In fact, back in 1978, I was a senior in college, and I was trying to get my teaching degree. And part of that process is to become a student teacher. So I was sent out to North Rowan High School in Rowan County to teach ninth grade history and 12th grade civics. I was 20 years old at the time. A young man named, by the name of Wayne Crowder was my teacher mentor. He had me observe him for about a week, and then he said, it's your turn. 
And I remember putting together my lesson plan all ready to go. I was going to show everyone what teaching's all about. <laughs> and I put together my history class. I think it was on Western culture and the U.S., the United States West, talking about cowboys and Indians. And then I was talking about civics, state government of all things. And I had my lesson plan in place. And I remember I'm ready to go, Mr. Crowder. And I walked into that ninth grade history class with my lesson plan, and I looked at the students, a great diverse group of people in Rowan County, and I looked at them, and they looked at me, and I started up. And I was giving it to them. And after 10 minutes, I was out of material. <laughs> I had nothing left. They weren't, I was asking them questions, and they gave me blank faces. I literally, for the next 40 minutes, was the longest 40 minutes of my life. And I thought to myself, you know what? This teaching's hard. It's hard work. And it's not just knowing the information, but it's how to convey it and how to have interaction and how to have logical and challenging uh, questions and then how to follow up. And it wasn't just about how good a speaker you were. And I'll never forget that 40 minutes of sheer terror as the teachers looked at me and went, boy, he doesn't know what he's doing. And Wayne Crowder was sitting there taking notes, doing an evaluation. The fortunate news is, is Wayne Crowder, then the teacher at North Orion High School, who I have stayed in touch with for 30 years, he helped guide me for the next several weeks. And I ended up student teaching for about, I think, three months. And he really taught me how to do it because he was a pro. And without that mentor, uh, I would have never been at least a decent student teacher. But it made me realize that this teaching profession is, is hard, it's fun, it's rewarding, and it's extremely challenging. And now that was over 35 years ago. And I know a lot's changed in teacher training, but I'm telling you right now, the challenge is even greater. And we've got to make sure that we have good teacher training programs for both new teachers and experienced teachers. And I'm looking at three ways that I think we need to reward teachers and respect teachers. And the first one is, I think, through performance. Just like all of us, whether it be governor, whether it be an engineer, whether it be an IT specialist, any profession, people are saying, did you do a good job or not? And can you improve in certain areas? And if so, how are you going to improve? And we need to look and find out how can we reward the teachers and then how can we build upon their strengths and correct their weaknesses. And by the way, this is not just K through 12. This is also at community colleges and our universities. So the actions that the UNC Board of Governors are taking are they're actually eliminating the chance that our teachers will luck into a great mentor like I happen to have and ensure that they have a rigorous field-based experience that will give them the skills they need to excel with their students in the classroom. And right now it might be a flip of the coin. If you don't have a good mentor, you're probably not going to end up being a good teacher. And you're going to fail in your first, second, or third year. And we've got to make sure that we train the leaders who then can train the other teachers, which fits into the second criteria, and that's leadership. You know, when I was in high school and, and in junior high, you can pick out the leaders of other teachers, the ones that the other teachers come to for advice. You can always pick out the best of the best teachers, too. Everyone knows who the good teachers are in a high school. All you have to do is ask the parents, the principals, and the students. And yet, for whatever reason, we can't figure out who the best teachers are, but everyone knows who they are. They know who the easy teachers are, they know who the tough teachers are, and they know who the good teachers are. And the main thing is we need to reward the leadership teachers, the ones who are helping others become even better teachers. It might be through visual aids, it might be instruction methods, it might be through testing. Uh, the, the leadership teacher is the one that should be promoted within the teaching ranks, and that's what we're recommending. I came through a corporation, Duke Power Company, and there was a period of time where all the engineers were paid the same amount of money. And the only way you could get a promotion is to go to the next level and become a supervisor. 
And that's often how it is in teaching. The only way you can get a promotion in teaching right now is you become an administrator. And the fact of the matter is some engineers and some teachers might not be good administrators, but they're the greatest teachers you can, they're fantastic teachers and you wanna keep them in teaching, just like you wanna keep certain engineers in engineering. But they should have a chance to promote, be promoted within these classifications and rewarded. And those rewards should come from performance and also are you a leadership teacher in helping other teachers? And we think there should be different pay scales with regard to that area. So we, you reward the best of the best. And that's where our training should be developed. So we train the best of the best and we improve the performance of those who are not satisfactory and where the performance is not showing for both the students and the school. And the third thing that we need to focus on is marketability. We need job-ready degrees faster and at less cost. Teaching is not an exception to this rule. We're seeing it right now, and I saw it as a former corporate recruiter. One of my jobs at Duke Power was a recruiter. I recruited engineers and managers and accountants and IT professionals for about six to seven years. And I'm excited that part of this program is developing campus-based recruitment plans that reflect current market research and regional district needs. And that's the way we need to think within the region, not always nationally, but within the region, even the regions of the state, which are dynamically different as you go from the east to the west. Too often, the bureaucracy, and yes, the education bureaucracy, gets in the way of talented people filling job openings that are desperately needed in our schools and in our workplace. Do you hear me? Sometimes we need to look at the mirror within the education bureaucracy and say, are we blocking a potential great teacher from entering our school at a point in time when we need the great teacher for the future? Let me give you a few examples of this. Right now in North Carolina, as we see in the nation, we have a massive, massive shortage of STEM teachers. They're the ones that stay the shortest period of time because they're all actually stolen by industry, including this one right here, and they pay a lot more money. And they're tough to recruit time, and plus it's a limited supply of people going into STEM programs in our high schools and our colleges. Yet, if an engineer here at SAS right now wants to go to another career into teaching and say be a physics teacher, Right now, they may, may need to take two years of courses to be fully licensed to teach in one of our high schools. Ladies and gentlemen, that is not what we need right now. We need to speed up the process and make it based upon competency. And if that SAS employee who then wants to become a teacher shows that they can teach through student teaching and picks up the skills very quickly, why not let them do it? Why put them through this educational bureaucracy maze when they've already showed that they have the skills? You know, we're doing this with the military right now in North Carolina. I'm working with the commanders of Fort Bragg right now, and we want to help the men and women who are returning home from Afghanistan and Iraq. Many of them, for example, for example, truck drivers. They're driving trucks literally af afraid of uh, bombs and devices that they'll lose their life on, and they're dri driving these massive trucks. They can drive anything, anywhere, under fire. And yet, when they come home to North Carolina, we're gonna make them take all these courses in truck driving school, and in fact, most of them that can teach it. Why don't we go ahead, and we're beginning this process, to go ahead and test out of the truck driving school. If they show they can do it, there's no reason they have to go through the educational maze of proving themselves again over a year or two year period and shelling out money and losing income at the same time. This is at a time, by the way, when we have a massive shortage of truck drivers in North Carolina. Well, the same thing applies to teaching. In fact, I heard earlier today, you heard from James Ford, our North Carolina Teacher of the Year. What an incredible, was he incredible? I don't even have to tell you what. Did he give a, I didn't hear it, but I can just anticipate. The guy is absolutely amazing. In fact, he was a, a member of our teacher advisory committee who recommended the pay increases and other performance measurements. Um, Geringer High School, he actually, before that, he was in journalism profession, 
and he's in one of the highest need schools in Charlotte, which I know extremely well being the former mayor. And uh, the point with him is, did we make it easier for him to enter the teaching profession as he changed from journalism? Because we need to get a skill like that into the classroom as quick as possible, as quick as possible. The second example is Eric Gukan, my education advisor. Please stand up, Eric. Y'all need to give him a round of applause. Let me give you an example of Eric here. Eric Gukan was told that he had to take a year and a half of courses to be fully licensed to teach in North Carolina. This despite, he had a master's degree in education from Harvard, and he taught two years in the South Bronx, New York for Teach of America. And yet, we were telling him that he had to go through a year and a half of programs to get a North Carolina license to teach. That's not, we've got to be more flexible. This is a guy who's a brilliant, brilliant individual. And um, we've, we've got to cut through the bureaucracy. And this, these are the things that I think this group is going to help us do. And uh, this is important not only for military personnel, it's important for education personnel in many, many different professions. We're going to look through this in education. So thanks to the leadership of many people in this room, we are making things easier for an 18-year-old undergrad, the next James Ford, or an Army engineer who wants to make a career change and enter the teaching profession because we also have a lot of members of the military who may be great instructors in the future, whether it be in our K through 12, our community colleges and technical training especially, and our universities. Let's, let's recruit them. Wouldn't it be great to hire a veteran coming home from Afghanistan or Iraq to be a teacher? What a great role model for our students here in North Carolina. So that's why I fully support your development of a public-private merit-based scholarship targeted to attract the very best teacher candidates who are preparing to teach in our highest need schools, districts, and subject areas. I also support, very strongly support, your effort to support more compensation for teachers who receive advanced degrees in high need fields or who commit to teach in high need schools. That's adapting to the marketplace. We have got to adapt to the marketplace like every other profession does at this point in time. And sometimes the marketplace requires you to pay more to certain teachers if they teach in areas where people don't want to teach or if they're teaching in programs where we can't find the supply needed to meet our students' needs. And I will continue, as your governor, to support any effort to close the skills gaps for our teachers and leaders and have a clear pathway to getting into classrooms and helping our teachers learn. We've got to think out of the box in all levels of education, K through 12, community colleges, and universities. So recommendations like these and others presented today are moving our system toward what's right for students, and I think it's going to help create more jobs in the future right here in North Carolina. I want to conclude today by again talking about James Ford because he is just such a great guy. In fact, I ran into him in Charlotte about three weekends ago and I came up to him and I said, James, I just saw the cover of Charlotte Magazine. And he had this big grin on his face. I ran into him at the Rite Aid in Charlotte. And I said, you were named Charlotte's Person of the Year. He was on the cover of the Charlotte Magazine. <laughs> and a teacher was named Person of the Year. I didn't say Teacher of the Year. I said Person of the Year. That's progress. That's tremendous progress. And by the way, there were other people nominated, people like Hugh McCall, uh, 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 entrepreneur Denise Watts, Anna Spangler Nelson, who's on the Board of Governors, she was nominated. The governor was not nominated, I might add. Um, <laughs> And guess what? A Garinger High School teacher won Person of the Year in Charlotte, North Carolina. That's progress, isn't it? That means we're starting to show respect. So uh, you've already heard from James. You know why he got it. And he continues to be a great spokesperson for all our state and our entire nation in teaching. I'm going to continue to use him along with Eric as an advisor to help us connect with teachers. And I want to continue to work with this committee and this group of individuals who I think have come up with a out-of-the-box thinking and this public-private cooperation is the way we're going to beat our competition 
and make sure our state continues to be the best state in the United States of America for not only this generation, but for generations to come. Thank you very much. It's an honor to be here, and thank you for your hard work. <laughs>